Welcome to a live Q&A with reverse mortgage experts. I'm Richard Eisenberg, Managing Editor and Money Editor at nextavenue.org, public media's first and only national journalism service for America's booming older population. And our experts today are with the National Reverse Mortgage Lenders Association. Their website is reversemortgage.org. It's especially appropriate that we're holding this webinar today because this is reverse Mortgage Education Week, and it looks like many Americans could use some education about reverse mortgages. A recent survey from the National Council on Aging found that consumers don't have a full understanding of reverse mortgages. That research was funded by the Financial Institutions Group at Reverse Mortgage Fund. I hope that by the end of today's webinar, we can help more people have a better understanding of reverse mortgages. Let me introduce you to our experts. They are Peter Bell. He's the president and CEO of the National Reverse Mortgage Lenders Association based in Washington, D.C. Lance Canada, a certified reverse mortgage professional and a senior's real estate specialist with First Bank in North Carolina. Tara Guy is vice president for operations at James B. Nutter & Company. J.B. Nutter originated the first reverse loan and became the largest wholesale revenue lender in the nation. She's based in Kansas City. And Phil Stevenson, he's the owner and principal of P.S. Financial Services, a certified reverse mortgage professional based in the Miami area. They'll be answering the questions that came to us from Next Avenue readers and from others. If you have reverse mortgage questions, you can type them into the webinar chat box you should see, and we'll do our best to get to them. And I should mention that there'll be a recording of the webinar at reversemortgage.org, and uh, the webinar slides will be available as a handout uh, through the webinar platform. You should be able to see that as well. So let's get started. Peter, why don't you say a little bit about uh, reverse mortgages, and then we'll get to the questions. Okay. Thank you, Richard, and thank you uh, to you and your colleagues at Next Avenue for giving us the opportunity to uh, educate your audience like this. Well, I guess beginning uh, from the start, what is a reverse mortgage? And uh, a lot of people get into very complex explanations of them, but I think it's important to understand that basically a reverse mortgage is a type of home equity loan that has been developed for homeowners over 62 years old that enables them to withdraw the equity that they've accumulated in their home over the years by paying down the mortgage or by making improvements to the home or by the growth in the value of the home. Um, it allows them to withdraw this money like any other home equity loan, but it has the additional feature of uh, not having a required monthly payment. The funds are advanced to the borrower, and the borrower can choose to make payments to repay on a current basis, or they can just uh, let the interest accrue and repay the loan when they uh, permanently leave the home because they sell it a move or after they pass away. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, so now that we have a basic understanding of what reverse mortgages are, let's just dive into the questions that uh, we've received. And uh, why don't we start with the first one for Phil? And that is, what is the difference between a reverse mortgage and a home equity loan? And then after that, how does the principal get paid back if there isn't any equity remaining? Phil? Thank you, Richard. So the difference between the reverse mortgage and a home equity loan, um, we're talking here more than anything about the line of credit option, because there are we're going to get into later the different options to draw funds from the reverse mortgage. So a home equity loan or a home equity line of credit, the HELOC that you see written there, um, unlike that, a reverse mortgage does not require a monthly payment of principal and interest. You only have to make your tax and insurance payments and maintain the home. One of the big aspects of the reverse mortgage line of credit is that it cannot be frozen or reset. Um, it also has a growth rate to it. So those are two very unique aspects that you don't get on your typical home equity line of credit. Uh, what do I mean by growth rate? It, it has a, a, an interest rate per se. You're not gaining interest. It's just your line of credit grows. So an example would be if you have a line of credit available of $100,000 and you don't touch it for a year. And let's just say that it's accruing at 5%. It's growing at 5%. In a year, you'll have 105,000 line of credit. So you start with 100 in a year, you'll have 105. The next year it grows more. Um, there is no program like that. Um, and the home equity lines that you get from a, from your bank, they usually have a, a predefined due date or a term. Usually it's 10 years that you have an interest only where you can draw. Um, and you can see here on the, on the screen, 
Uh, on the left column, you've got the HELOC, your regular home equity line of credit. And on the right, you've got the HECM, or the reverse mortgage line of credit. <clears throat> so on the left, the HELOC, you'll see that you have ongoing monthly payments, and you have that predefined due date, maybe a 10-year term of interest only, and then it'll either balloon, which means you have to pay it off at the end of the 10 years, or you have a five-year or 10-year amortization, which means you have to pay the principal and the interest, which is usually pretty big compared to what you were paying for those first 10 years. Um, Two other important features on the right towards the bottom of this square is that the reverse mortgage line of credit is a non-recourse loan, um, which answers the second part of the, of the question, and that's that the lenders uh, or the servicing companies that hold these reverse mortgages when, when you have it uh, over time, they have no other recourse but the property itself. So they can't go after the heirs for money or, or anyone else if the property is upside down. So an, an example of that is if you have a market crash, for example, and, and the value is 200000 but you owe 300000 on the reverse mortgage that you borrowed, uh, you don't have to pay that loss. Your heirs don't have to pay that difference between the two and 300000 It's a non-recourse loan, so the FHA's mortgage insurance will step in and cover that loss. Um, Phil, you mentioned something called HECM. What, what is a HECM? HECM is, is the, uh, the FHA's reverse mortgage, because there are many reverse mortgages that have been out there over the years. Uh, over the decades, there have been many types of reverse mortgages, but the HECM is the Home Equity Conversion Mortgage, and that's FHA's reverse mortgage, and that's the one that we're, we're talking about today, which is the most popular and uh, the one with the most protections in place for the borrowers. Thank you. Uh, so let's move on to question number two from uh, our audience, and that was, oh, and this is for Lance. Uh, the question here, Lance, is what is the maximum amount that I can borrow against the assessed value of my home? And then related to that, what if I still have a principal balance? So why don't we take those one at a time? Okay. So your each loan is different because it depends on the person's age starting at 62 and better also the home value so everybody's home is different and also interest rates and any upfront costs that's how we determine what is available so FHA has a upper limit of six hundred and thirty six thousand hundred and fifty dollars so if your home is above that number we will default to the 636150 so let's just give an example you have a home that's worth three hundred thousand dollars a 70 year old couple and based on the current interest rates that will determine the amount that is available to you now also the amount that is available to you it depends on what state you live because some states have higher costs to record the loan and and other taxes and so forth so uh, NERMLA does have a, a website that you can go to wherein you can punch in your zip code your date of birth the approximate value of your home and it will calculate some figures and give you a pretty good idea of what is available to you <clears throat> also it's a good time to mention that uh, even if you deal with a, a HECM a home equity conversion mortgage counselor or a like we are representatives <clears throat> we might be able to work a better deal for you as well as far as the origination goes as well and, and your counselors will tell you to shop around and that is what determines what is available also the second part of the question about any existing mortgage when a person has the proceeds of the reverse mortgage, they have to pay off any existing mortgage that is there. That's just like a traditional refi. If you have a mortgage on the property, that has to be paid off. And if you think about it, uh, if a person is retired or wanting to retire, uh, 62 years of age and better, and they're still carrying a traditional mortgage into retirement, that can be uh, quite a burden on folks. So a home equity conversion mortgage will allow them to pay that off, and if there are any existing funds available, they can use that for 
any other option that they have. Well, thanks, Lance. Now, there are a couple of things you said I want to ask a little bit more about. So let's go back to the first part of this question, which is what's the maximum amount you can borrow? So can somebody ever borrow 100% of their mortgage? I know you said there was that FHA limit of 636000 but if my house is worth, say, $200,000, can I get a reverse mortgage for two hundred thousand dollars? No, uh, you cannot. So again, it's based on age, and the value of your home will determine what is available. And it is an age-driven product. So, a person that is sixty-two would not receive as much as a person who was eighty. It works very much like an annuity. Uh, so, our projected lifespan. So the amount that you receive is very personalized based on your age, but it's never a hundred percent loan. Richard, let, let me interject on that. Um, sure. The I concept could. here is important to understand. The lender is advancing an amount of funds that is a percentage of the value of the property and reserving the remaining value of the property to cover the interest that will accrue over the life of the loan. So, therefore, if you're younger, the interest will presumably be accruing over a longer duration of time. So, therefore, the amount of money you get at first is lower. Um, whereas, if you're older, then it's uh, presumed that you will be occupying the home for a shorter duration of time. So, therefore, the amount of the home's value that needs to be preserved to cover the interest accrual can be smaller and a larger amount is available. And the ranges today, uh, maybe others could, uh, I'm, I'm going to give very ballpark figures, but roughly from, uh, uh, for the youngest borrowers, roughly uh, 50, 50 something percent of the value of the property to uh, the oldest borrowers would probably be approaching uh, 70 something percent of the value of the property. Great. Thank lenders you. on board, do you guys concur that those numbers, those percentages are, are a rough ballpark estimate? Yes. That's about right, Peter. Yeah. Thank you. That's very helpful. Uh, and another thing I want to go back to is something Lance said. You mentioned uh, that one of the factors that goes into how much you can borrow is the interest rate. Can you talk a little bit about what you mean by that? And, and, and can you or Peter or any of the group uh, tell us uh, what the typical interest rate is these days for reverse mortgage? So, Lance, you want to? Yeah, or you? Sure, sure. Go, so, go ahead, Lance. Depending on what program, I'll just start it and then uh, anyone can jump in, but depending on the program that a person uses, it could be a fixed rate program or an adjustable rate program. And um, rates these days are, are hovering around 4% uh, for the adjustable program. The fixed rate program is, is hovering around 499 or 5.06 uh, where folks can maximize on the amount that's available to them. Great, thank you. Yeah. And, and the way that the interest makes rate makes a difference is, as I explained before, you're preserving some amount of the uh, property's value to cover the future interest accrual. So if you have a higher interest rate, you're going to have to reserve more of that. So the higher the interest rate on the loan, the lower the percentage of value. Great, thank you for explaining that. Uh, let's move on to question number three, and I guess I would preface this um, by saying that uh, uh, the um, in the past, um, the reverse mortgage industry has had sort of a, I would say maybe a checkered reputation where there were all kinds of mortgages being made and all kinds of lenders making them, and that's changed quite a bit in recent years. In fact, I would say I've been, I've been doing personal finance journalism since the, uh, the early 80s, and uh, at, when I was starting, um, at least it's been, uh, at, you know, for many years, financial advisors were not often recommending reverse mortgages for people in retirement, but that's really changed. I would say in the past few years, I'm hearing many, many more financial advisors saying a reverse mortgage is something you may want to consider if you're looking for extra income in retirement. So with that said, as a setup, Lance, um, the question we got from one of our Next Avenue readers was, can reverse mortgages be trusted or can they sometimes be a scam? That, that's a very common question. Uh, can they be trusted? Well, I'll, I'll just read some bullet points on the, this HECM or home equity conversion mortgage. First of all, the answer is yes, they can be. This loan is an FHA insured loan, which means that FHA is monitoring 
the activities of those who do these HECM loans. All of the HECM reverse mortgage loan borrowers, they have to meet with an independent third-party counselor even before they apply for the loan. Now, these counselors are there for the purpose of making sure that there is not a scam involved. They will question, make sure that uh, they're not being pressured, make sure even if there was a loan officer that was a little unscrupulous, that they're not somehow trying to use this program to defraud or hurt a senior. So the scams, the frauds, financial exploitation of older adults, uh, that's considered elder abuse, and there are some very strict penalties for such a thing. The HECM counselors and the National Reverse Mortgage Lenders Association, all of us are trained to recognize when a senior appears to be pressured, to take this loan. So there are protocols in place to combat, identify, and report any type of scams that are out there. Right. And, and Richard, we like to encourage uh, people that are considering a reverse mortgage to make sure they're working with a uh, company that's a member of the National Reverse Mortgage Lenders Association because all of our members are bound by a code of ethics and professional responsibility and uh, we have an ethics committee that uh, accepts uh, complaints from consumers or from counselors um, if anybody feels that they've been mistreated and uh, then we uh, take action and will sanction uh, any lender that, that's behaving inappropriately. But our members all understand the code of ethics and professional responsibility and uh, adhere to it. So uh, that's another layer of safeguard. So you have, uh, as Lance said, the counseling that everybody goes to an independent counselor. And I would tell people, if you're talking to a lender and they downplay the counseling or don't tell you that there's counseling, that's a pretty good sign that you're not dealing with a, a scrupulous lender. So if uh, you're dealing with a lender and they uh, don't uh, emphatically support the counseling, uh, run, don't walk to another lender. Thank you, Peter. And I, I believe you also have some resources for people, and which is part of the handout, where you can go to report fraud or exploitation if you think there's some abuse, uh, you have some questions about it, lots of um, uh, organizations yeah. with websites and phone numbers, right? Absolutely, yes. Uh, we have a slide here with a bunch of organizations that complaints can be filed with. But uh, we urge people to come to our uh, uh, reverse mortgage lenders website, reversemortgage.org, and to um, file a, uh, a, a consumer complaint there so that we could deal with it through our ethics committee and also bring it to the attention of any public authorities that should be notified. Um, but for the you. most part, I would say if you're dealing with a mainstream lender who is uh, displaying the fact that they're a member of NERMLA, of the National Reverse Mortgage Lenders Association, you should be uh, reasonably assured that you're dealing with somebody who, uh, whose conduct you can be comfortable with. And Peter, just one last question on this. What do you think has changed the most in the past few years um, so that this is not the issue that it was before? Is it that the loans have become standardized? Are there new federal rules? What, what's happened that's, uh, that's changed? It, it's a lot of the above. It's the uh, industry has gotten more sophisticated in a lot of ways. The technology to uh, find and weed out uh, bad players is much better. The CFPB overseeing the industry has added another element of scrutiny that's been useful. And uh, I, I think that uh, consumers are much more sophisticated. So there's a lot more. They do their homework online, and there's a lot more information. The other thing I will say is while you hear about reverse mortgage scams here and there, and uh, I've been doing this 20 years now, so I've heard lots of them, the majority of them are not necessarily on the lending side, but rather with people that deal with the senior after they have the money, oftentimes members of their own family. So it's important for people to uh, be wary of people that come to sell them different products, whether it's home improvements um, or, or other things, or family members that are uh, urging them to get the reverse mortgage in order to give them assistance. Um, I think you have to be as wary of that as uh, you do in selecting a lender. 
Thank you. Uh, you mentioned the CFPB, just for people who are listening who might not know, that's the uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and they have some very good materials on their website for free uh, that uh, explain reverse mortgages and things to know about them. Another group that does some very good work on this is the National Council on Aging. Um, I would encourage you to check out their website as well. Um, and then if I can make a little plug for Next Avenue, where I work, nextavenue.org, we've done quite a number of articles about reverse mortgages and what you should know about them. So um, there's a lot of good information out there if you uh, want to spend the time to look for it. So let's go on to question number four. This is for Phil. The question here is, can you outlive a reverse mortgage and be forced to move out of your house? Thanks, Richard. Um, I, I like to have a little bit of fun with this question whenever a borrower or a client asks me this because I do say yes. Yes, you cannot live the reverse mortgage. We can kick you out of the home when you turn 150 years old. So the reverse mortgage does have a date on the mortgage document. It's a legal document, so you need a date when this mortgage will end, and it's the younger borrower's 150th birthday. So we know it'll, none of us will ever reach 150, at least not at this point uh, in history, maybe in the future, but uh, it, that is the date that we have in there. So you can live there for the rest of your life as long as you follow what we have here. So as long as you continue living in the home as your primary residence, uh, at least one borrower. So if you're a married couple and uh, one goes to a nursing home, the other one stays, or to a rehabilitation center, the other one stays, you're okay. If one passes away, the other one stays in the home, you're okay. But if one passes away and then the other one goes to move with the kids, as an example, then you do have to sell the house or refinance and somehow pay off the reverse mortgage. Now, you must stay current on your taxes and insurance. If you hear out there that somebody lost their home because of a reverse mortgage, I can almost guarantee that if you really dig deeper and you say, well, what exactly happened? And they say, well, I wasn't paying my property taxes or my homeowner's insurance, and then they foreclosed on me. Well, you know, if you, if you don't owe anything on your home and you don't pay your property taxes, there'll be a tax lien and somebody's going to take your house. So it's not that the reverse mortgage takes your home, it's that they didn't comply with these rules here in paying their taxes and insurance, or in maintaining the condition of the home. So what do we mean by that is uh, I'm in Miami, so we have hurricanes. If a hurricane comes and knocks down a tree, and the tree falls into the house, and the roof caves in in a certain area of your home, and you just leave it there. You don't uh, do any work to maintain it, to fix it. Well, at that point, we can you're, you're neglecting the home, and, and we can uh, force you to move out and, and call the loan due and payable, the reverse mortgage. So as long as you comply paying your taxes, your insurance, you live in the home as your primary residence and you maintain the condition of your home, and as long as you're not 150 years old, then you can stay in the home without any problems. Uh, and let me just follow up, Phil, on uh, the question about uh, married couples. So do both spouses have to be 60, uh, over 62, and do both of them have to have the name on the title of the home? It's a very good question, and it's been a big point of contention in our industry uh, because before August of 2014, um, we did not have protections for non-borrowing spouse. The non-borrowing spouse is, is one of the spouses that are not signing on the mortgage as a borrower. Uh, the, more, the more popular scenario is one borrower is over 62, and then the, the other spouse is under 62. And before August of 2014, the younger spouse was, was left off of the reverse mortgage completely and not protected. Therefore, if the older one passed away, the younger one would be forced to move out of the home, sell the property, pay off the reverse mortgage, or, or refinance the reverse mortgage into a regular mortgage. But now, as of August of 2014, the non-borrowing spouse is protected. They can stay in the home for the rest of their lives, they just can't access or borrow any additional funds if there was money left over in the reverse mortgage line of credit. Um, so for the eligible non-borrowing spouse, the one that can stay in the home for the rest of their lives to qualify, um, they need to be living in the home, they need to be married to the, the borrower at the time of the uh, closing as well as uh, after the borrower has passed away. And um, that, that's pretty much it. If they're ineligible, sometimes we do have spouses that are married. And I, I had a case where the husband is in South America and the wife 
is here, they're separated, but they're, they'll never get divorced. Um, in those cases, we're able to still write the reverse mortgage on the borrower that lives here in the States. And uh, the other one did go through counseling and just acknowledge that they understand the reverse mortgage is going on, but they are ineligible non-borrowing spouses and they will not be protected should the borrower pass away. Uh, so there are various cases like that where, where we can make it work one way or the other, but they are protected by non-borrowing spouses. Great. Thank you, Phil. Um, before we go on to the next question, I just want to remind our audience that if anybody is uh, participating and listening and has questions of their own, uh, feel free to send them to us at the GoToWebinar control panel you should see there, and uh, we'll do our best to try to answer them during the course of the hour if we have time. But let me get to question number five from uh, Next Avenue readers and other people who sent in questions. And this is for Lance. Uh, the question is, I own my home. How much can I actually get each month? Or can I get a lump sum? And if I do this, will I be able to leave my home to a child later? So why don't we split those in half and first talk about how much you can get every month, the different types of ways that people can actually receive the money, and how lump sums work when it comes to reverse mortgage. Sure. So a person owning their home free and clear is one of the best case scenarios. That way they don't have to pay off an existing mortgage. The amount that is available uh, de depends on the client. They can set it up um, to get so much a month. Uh, there, there are a bunch of options that are available. So again, just to reiterate, we take a person's age and we go by the age of the youngest spouse, the home value, along with interest rates and costs. That is what determines what is available. So once you have that figure, then you can determine how you would like to receive payment. And some of the payment options are uh, a line of credit. You could do a term payment. For instance, you can say, okay, I have $200,000 in my reverse mortgage. Uh, I want to spread that out over 10 years to get me to age 70 so I can get more from Social Security or whatever scenario you can break those that that income down to a 10 year period you have a 10 year a t e n u r e payment which is based on how long you live and you would get x amount of dollars every month as long as you live as long as you're in that home also you have a combination of those you have a modified term and you can do a line of credit so let's just say you have that $200,000 you can take a percentage of it and leave that in a line of credit, and then you can set up the remainder that's in there as a term payment to get X amount of dollars for X amount of time. You can do the same thing with the modified tenure, where you can set uh, so much money into a line of credit, and the remainder set it up as a tenure payment, which means as long as you are remaining and living in that home, uh, you would receive funds from that. There is a single disbursement lump sum, and we really discourage that unless you're paying off a large mortgage or if you're purchasing a home with the HECM. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, we want these funds to last the client as long as they possibly can. And so taking a lump sum, sometimes you know it, it invites folks out of the woodwork. Perhaps they mismanage it because they still have to pay their taxes and insurance. So it can be set up in so many different ways that a client can really use this to, to really enhance the quality of their retirement. And I can answer the second part of that question, which was, would you be able to leave your home to a child? Thanks, the answer is, hi. And the answer is yes. Um, after the last surviving borrower or remaining eligible non-borrowing spouse passes away or permanently leaves the home, there are several ways the loan can be repaid, and your heirs or estate can do one of the following. They can sell the property and use the proceeds from the sale to pay the loan balance. They can also use any personal funds or gifted money to repay that loan. Uh, they can also, if they choose, to purchase the property. Um, if they do so, they can do it at 95% of the current appraised value, so they're not having to do it at the full appraised value. 
or you know worrying about the current loan balance. Or they can provide the lender a deed in lieu of foreclosure, which this means that the heirs would provide a clear and marketable title through executing a deed to the lender to forego to do anything else with the property. So if they did a deed in lieu, they're basically signing a deed to the lender, surrendering the keys to the property, and they no longer have to do anything else with that property. I would like everyone to keep in mind, um, in, re in reference to inheritance, um, the reverse mortgage loans are not assumable and the heirs cannot take possession of that home until the reverse mortgage lien is satisfied. And again, they can satisfy that lien by repaying the loan with personal funds. They can use funds from the estate if available, gifted funds, or they can go out and obtain their own separate mortgage financing if they qualify and they can pay that loan off in that manner. Thank you, Tara. Um, just one, one question for you or Lance or anybody in the group. Um, is there any kind of financial qualification that people need to go through in order to get a reverse mortgage um, to mostly to prevent people from taking one out when they may not really be able to afford to do that? Uh, sure, I'll go ahead with that, Peter here. Um, we have added into the reverse mortgage origination process over the last couple of years a financial assessment process, which is a form of underwriting that has been developed specifically for the reverse mortgage uh, product. And the concept here is to make sure that once people get the reverse mortgage that they will, in fact, have enough money to meet their obligations. Uh, to pay their taxes and insurance, and also to be able to live on. So the financial assessment takes a look at their sources of income, at their asset base, and looks at spending that asset base uh, down over uh, their life expectancy. And then uh, against that looks at the cost for taxes and insurance, which in the end leaves a residual income amount, residual cash flow amount. And we want to make sure that that residual cash flow amount is sufficient enough for them to live on. Otherwise, they're going to be headed to default. If it comes up that there's a shortfall, then the lender, it doesn't mean the loan doesn't go forward, but it might mean that the lender would require that some of the reverse mortgage funds be placed into a set-aside to be used to cover future taxes and insurance. Thank you. Thanks for explaining that, Peter. appreciate that. Um, before we go on to question number six uh, for Tara, um, I should just mention again that uh, there are a lot of really great handouts with this webinar. You, you should be able to see them as you're watching the webinar over to the side. Uh, and you can print those out later on uh, after we're finished so you can read up on some of the things you're hearing today. So let me go to question number six for Kara, and that's this. I was told that at death your house is immediately taken by the mortgage company and there's no time for children to get their things out. Is that true? No, that is not correct, and it's not correct no matter what the reason is for calling the loan due and payable. Um, there are several steps that I'd like to go through that will explain how this process works from when it becomes due and payable through to what the lender does and the timelines and what the heirs options are. And we'll start with what reasons can cause the loan to become due and payable. So a reverse loan becomes due and payable when the last surviving borrower either sells the home, uh, they convey the title of the property to someone else, so that means the borrower no longer has an ownership interest, the borrower passes away, uh, the borrower resides outside of the principal residence, so that uh, last surviving borrower has vacated the premises for a period exceeding 12 consecutive months, and that can be due to physical illness or mental illness or simply by choice. The borrower also, and I think this has been mentioned previously, if the borrower fails to pay their property taxes or their homeowner's insurance premiums, condo fees, and other mandatory obligations, all those options that were exhausted to pay, bring the loan current, then it would become due and payable. And the other reason would be if the borrower failed to maintain the home, so it fell into uh, disrepair. So those are the reasons that a loan could be called due and payable on a reverse. 
Once the, the next step, if the loan does become due and payable, the lender is required to follow specific timelines and steps in the process. So the first thing that would happen, the lender will send a letter, which is called a demand letter, and that letter explains the process and timelines for repaying the loan to the heirs. Now, the lender will work with your appointed heirs and guide them through each of the options once that demand letter has come out and the heirs and the lender have communicated. The lender will communicate these options to the heirs. After the last surviving borrower or remaining non-eligible borrowing spouse passes away or permanently leaves the home, there are these ways that the loan can be repaid by the estate or the heirs. They can sell the property and use the proceeds of the sale to pay the loan balance. Again, they can use their own personal funds or gifted money to repay it. They can purchase the property for 95% of the appraised value. This option is known as a short sale, and it can be utilized for family members or non-family members. And what that means is the lender has agreed to accept less than the actual balance for, for payoff. So that allows someone to purchase that property at 95% of the current appraised value. Tara, who does, who does the appraisal? Who sets the appraised value there? Well, the lenders really request the heirs to obtain an appraisal, but, you know, 99% of the time that doesn't happen. So the lender will order an appraisal um, within the 30 days from the call due date. Thanks. And then we will work with the heirs you know, through that appraisal. Um, the other option is, again, a deed, in lieu, a deed in lieu can be given from the heirs to the lender, and that is the process of exchanging the property for the debt, and this option is normally chosen when the heirs don't want to keep the property or try to sell it. They just want to hand it to the lender, and, and the lender will take care of it. Um, one last option is the heirs can obtain their own financing um, and pay off the debt. So once the demand letter and the options are provided, your heirs will have 30 days from the date of that demand letter to choose one of those options. And depending on the option chosen, there are extensions of the timeline available, and the lender would go through those with the heirs. So as you can see, you're at the heirs, would have plenty of time to remove your personal property. Um, last thing I would like to mention on this subject is it's very highly important that you would communicate with your lender and make sure that the lender has up-to-date information regarding your heirs or authorized third-party contact. It is also equally important for you to provide your heirs the lender's contact information because the earlier your lender and heirs are able to make contact with each other, the more time your heirs will have to choose the option. So there is a booklet available talking about what you would do when your loan becomes due. You can find it out on NERMLA's website at www.reversemortgage.org slash repayment. And it is called, What Do I Do When My Loan Is Due? And that booklet is chock full of information and it goes over all the information that I just provided. So it's a very helpful resource for you out on NERMA's website. Thank you. And Lance, do you want to talk a little bit about um, bringing the family in to talk about these things? Sure. And, and that's such a crucial thing, Richard, because, you know, you don't, you don't want to ask broke people financial advice. Uh, it, it just doesn't make sense. And when it comes to these uh, home equity conversion mortgages, our natural tendency is to ask somebody about them. But if they haven't been educated as to these programs, these reverse mortgages, the information that you're getting may not be correct. So as Tara brought out and, and all the others, this is all laid out. It's in writing. It's law. And it's there. So take a trusted advisor. That could be a family member. Uh, it could be an attorney, a close friend. Get them involved to help you understand this program. Uh, and, and you're encouraged to do that. You can bring a family member to the counseling. You can bring your financial uh, planner to the counseling. 
uh, you can bring anyone to the counseling that will help you to understand this program. And, and here's the important thing about this counseling. It's not designed to make you do a reverse mortgage. It's designed to educate. And that's the biggest thing about this program because the more education you have about the program, the better you're off you are to be able to make an educated decision. And sometimes the, the decision is no, I don't need it. But make an educated decision because the helps are out there and they're designed to protect you and help you with this process. Thank you. Um, can anybody give us a rough idea of how much time we're talking about? I understand it's going to vary a lot, but just so people have a, a ballpark figure, between the time um, somebody uh, passes on or sells the house and the time that the next decision has to be made, the loan has to get paid off, we're talking about a month or a year or normal. This is Tara. Um, normally, if the, if the loan is going to be paid off, it, it well, you normally the heirs or whoever has 30 days. So if you're talking about the origination side, and um, that varies. You know, and it normally is the normal process. Once they have counseling, they take application, titles done, appraisals done, whatever. But if you're talking about after the loan becomes due and payable, the heirs initially have 30 days, but then they will continue working with the lender through the process, and it you know it can be extended. I hope I answered the question. Yeah, Peter. yeah, Richard, the uh, heirs, as Sarah said, there's a 30-day period, and part of the uh, concern, you know, the question about, I hear they take your house immediately, I think stems from that the uh, so-called 30-day letter, the letter that uh, uh, basically has the demand for the repayment that has to come within 30 days of the lender learning of the borrower's death, has some, uh, what I would consider to be somewhat harsh language in it. It's language that HUD requires the lenders to use. We uh, have been trying to persuade the department for years that maybe we could use some uh, uh, softer, friendlier language uh, in it. But that's the language that's required now, so it scares people. But essentially, if the heirs follow up with the lender, and it's their decision that they're either trying to buy the house and they need to arrange financing, or they're putting the house up for sale and they actually can show uh, a good faith progress in doing so, such as listing it with a realtor, uh, the lender can give them um, initially up to six months, and then uh, uh, if the good faith effort is there, uh, two more three-month extensions to uh, pay off the loan. So there is some flexibility, but it's only there if the uh, heirs um, or the estate actually work openly with the loan servicer on it. Great. Thank you. And Peter, I would, I'd, I'd just like to add, when the lender is granted those extensions, there are obligations uh, to the heir, responsibility that they would have to provide documentation, you know, an agreement that they sign with the realtor because they have it listed for sale. Um, if they decide to sell it, you know, on their own, then perhaps a newspaper ad or, you know, social media blitz that shows that they're trying to sell it. So they would have to provide documentation, but then the lender would continue to work with them through the process, as Peter mentioned. Great. Uh, let me move on to question number seven, um, and I want to say that we've gotten some really great questions from our audience. I'm hoping we're going to be able to get to a few of those as well. So here's a question for Phil, and the question is, what happens if you want to sell the house before the end of the time period on the loan? How do you pay it off, and, and what's the interest rate then? Sure. So it's in this sense, it's similar to a regular mortgage. Um, if you want to sell the house, let's say you take out the reverse mortgage and in a few years you decide you want to move closer to your kids or what have you, you whenever you go to close on the sale, the title company is going to ask or you, the attorney is going to ask the reverse mortgage lender or servicer for a payoff. So if you borrowed $100,000 and over the years $50,000 in interest has accrued, uh, your payoff will be $150,000. So whenever you sell the house at X amount, you pay off the principal that you borrowed plus the interest that has accrued on your loan amount um, because you, you're not, you don't have to make those payments. Uh, so that interest has accrued. Once you sell the house, they'll pay off that, that mortgage. Um, so you can sell at any time, you can refinance at any time, 
if you win the lottery and you want to pay it off, you can pay it off or, or come into some inheritance or anything like that, you can pay off the reverse mortgage. Uh, there's no fixed 30-year maturation period like a 30-year fixed forward mortgage, as we call it, or a regular mortgage. Because um, remember, you can live in the home for the rest of your life. So if you get it at 62 and you live to 102, you can still be there for those 40 years. Um, the loan becomes due and payable when, when you move, when you sell, or when the borrowers pass away, or as we mentioned before, you fail to pay the property taxes and insurance or maintain the property. Um, Great. Thank you. Uh, just to add, if you, if you want to request a payoff, um, that's not being done through the sale of your house, and you would simply just contact your servicing lender and tell them you would like a payoff statement. Normally the lender will ask you if there's a particular date that you would like the payoff statement made good through. Um, this is important because if you do not pay the loan off by the good through date, you, you would be subject to additional interest and possible other charges, so you'd want to get an updated statement. Thank Correct. You. And, and and, and something else, um, and, and, and I apologize now, <laughs> I just lost it. I had it with, with something okay. what Tara was saying, uh, but it, it'll come back to me and I'll just interject later. No problem. Thank you. Uh, let's go on to question number eight, and actually this relates to a question that we just received uh, while we've been talking. The question here, this is for Lance, is if you get a reverse mortgage and then circumstances dictate that you need to move to a care facility, assisted living, a nursing home, what happens then? Uh, so that's another excellent question, uh, and it comes up a lot. But here's what's nice about this program. It really depends on a few factors. Um, if it's a husband and wife, or if it's a single person. So if the husband and wife are both on this loan and one of the mates for some reason has to go to a facility, that does not call this loan due, this loan due and payable. Uh, as long as the co-borrower is still in the home, living there as the primary resident, uh, they're fine. Now sometimes, you know, folks don't know how long they're going to be in a facility. It could be a temporary thing. Uh, and if they come back home, that's fine. Now, if it's a single borrower, uh, if they move to a facility that is permanent, and I mean longer than 12 months, then the loan would have to be repaid through either selling the home or outside funds. Now, if it's a non-borrowing spouse, then they cannot continue to live in the home if the spouse is moved permanently to a care facility. Great. So, Richard, just to clarify here, an eligible non-borrowing spouse can continue living in the home after the borrower passes away, but not necessarily if the uh, borrower is in a nursing home for a while. Um, this is uh, something in the program that uh, is a concern of ours that we hope we could work with HUD to get the same treatment for the non-borrowing spouse in either of those two circumstances. Um. And this related question that came in was, what, what if the borrower is going to a nursing home and isn't, it's not known whether they are going to return back to the home or they're not, how much time do they have before the lender takes any kind of action? The, it's the one year have, again. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead, Sarah. Uh, they, if the borrower has, they can be outside the home for up to 12 consecutive months. Once they've reached the 12 consecutive months that they've, that they've been out of the home, then the loan would be called due and payable. So it's, again, really important that uh, the borrowers keep good communication with their lenders. So if they perhaps know that they're going to be vacating their home for an extended period due to an illness, a surgery, a hospital stay, perhaps they're even going to take an extended visit to, to one of their family members out of state, it would be good for the, you to contact your lender and just let them know because there is a requirement of HUD that the lender has to occupy, or excuse me, certify your occupancy annually. So if you happen to vacate the property for an extended period, you know, not up to past 12 months, but you're gone two or three, four months, whatever, um, and you did not let the lender know, and it was at the time the lender has to send out the occupancy certification form, 
then that form would be returned back as, you know, undeliverable or it wasn't answered. And if we do not get your certification back, then we would assume that you may not possibly be living there any longer because we weren't notified. So what happens is the lender would send a second occupancy certification, make a second attempt. If we don't get that back again, then after that second attempt, the lender is going to go and order a property inspection. So they would contact a vendor that they work with that goes out and inspects the property to, to verify if they can, if it's occupied, if it's occupied by you, the borrower, or, you know, see what's going on. So that's why it's critical for you to, you know, communicate to your lender when, whenever possible, when you know that you may be having an extended stay outside the home, and that way we can note the system and you know, you're, it'll prevent your loan from becoming due and payable. It's also good to let them know once you return to the home. So just remember, you can be in and out of the home up to 12 consecutive months. Once you hit the 12 consecutive months, then the lender could call it due and payable. Thank you. Um, so we have about eight minutes left. We have a few more questions I want to get to. Uh, the next one is for Phil, and it's almost the flip side of what we've been talking about. This was a question we received and was, can I buy a home? Can I buy a home that has a reverse mortgage that is underwater? The owner wants me to have it. Can I work for the FHA to buy it for the appraised value? How does that work, Phil? Yes, so I, I gave an example earlier of somebody who's underwater or upside down. In other words, they owe more than the current value. So this happened a lot with people that did the reverse mortgage during the real estate boom when, when values were at their peak and then values crashed. So let's say you owe 300000 and the value crashed to 200,000. Well, there's that underwater or upside down of 100,000. Um, an heir, so not just someone else buying, but but an heir can buy the home uh, from the lender at 95% of the value. So remember the value that we have. An appraiser went out and says the value of this home is 200,000, but the reverse mortgage balance is 300,000. Um, they can purchase the home at 95% of the 200 value, which means they can buy it at 190,000. It's a sort of short sale. Um, you don't have to qualify the way you do for other short sales. Um, it's just it's just one of the reverse mortgage rules that you can buy it there at the the 95% of the value. Um, you don't have to pay that that loss, that hundred thousand dollar loss. Great, thank you. Um, no now, a, a, a little narrow question, but uh, something I think is important for certain types of homeowners, and that is, uh, and this is for Lance. Somebody wrote in saying, I have a, I own a small condominium in Washington, D.C., currently valued at around $300,000. I'm now 62, plan to retire in three years. Can I get a reverse mortgage on a condominium? So not just Washington, D.C., but just condominiums in general. What's the rule about that, Lance? Oops. Yeah, I think this one was actually for, for me, for Phil. Oh, I'm sorry, um, Phil. No problem. Yes, you can oh, get okay. the, the, the FHA reverse mortgage, the Heckam reverse mortgage, on a condo as long as the condo association is FHA approved. Now, in, in here in Florida, 90% of all condo associations are not FHA approved uh, because it is a process that you have to go through. Essentially, we need to check and see if the condo association has... Uh, healthy financial status, so to speak, that they have the right amount of insurance coverage, that they have insurance from uh, fraud and embezzlement, that they have um, not too many people, I think it's 10% of, of the owners that are in default, no more than 10% are in default on their HOA dues, uh, which is their monthly or quarterly payment. Um, you have to make sure they have a certain amount of money in reserve account no special assessment. So there's a lot of things we have to look at. We put all that paperwork together, send it to FHA. When FHA approves it, then any any unit within the condo association can then get any FHA mortgage, whether it's a regular FHA or a HECM, the reverse mortgage FHA. Um, so it is, it is a process that adds another two to four, maybe six weeks before you even start the reverse mortgage process. Um, Certain companies can tell you right off if they qualify or not. Um, and one thing you do have to have as an individual unit owner, 
the condo association covers their insurance covers the exterior of the building and the windows but not the walls in so the drywall the the flooring the cabinets you have to have your own separate insurance for that um, so it can be done with a condo uh, it's not always it's something that we would have to research any lender uh, reverse mortgage lender should have the capability of researching that for you thank you um, and which properties are not eligible Lance I think that's something you were going to talk about sure so mainly the Heckham reverse mortgage is for your primary residence so the ineligible properties would be investment properties vacation homes cooperatives bed and breakfast uh, and new construction without a certificate of occupancy so a new home would have to have that certificate of occupancy and then we could do uh, a reverse mortgage on it but those are your ineligible properties as of now thank you um, so we have just about maybe four minutes left so I, we have a, a few great questions from our audience I want to try to get to a few of those now so we may try to do this as kind of a lightning round I would say Anybody can just jump in with a quick answer. The first question somebody asked was, how can we find these third-party counselors? So where do people go for that? Sure. Uh, there's a HUD directory on the HUD website of HUD.gov of the counselors. And uh, when you go to a lender, a lender provides a list of counselors uh, that are available. Every lender has to um, provide to all clients a list of counseling options that includes a couple of national intermediaries they refer to them as uh, which are counseling organizations approved by HUD to do telephonic counseling anywhere in the country as well as a list of counselors available nearby in case the um, client has an interest in going to do the counseling face-to-face -face. so the best way is to work with a lender and get a list of counselors from them and then it's up to the client to contact the counseling agencies and schedule uh, their counseling appointment to be done either telephonically or face-to-face -face. okay thank you so uh, I would say people want to start by going to hud.gov hud.gov and, and start there um, yes another... and, you, and use the search looking for HECM HECM counselors great thank you uh, another question that came in is um, one of the uh, panelists mentioned um, the criteria about um, you know about mortgages and it being that you need to maintain the property uh, what, what does that mean what criteria go into that the homes being maintained properly well, it's, okay, it's just it's just like if you had a 30-year traditional mortgage uh, you will still maintain your home you still have to keep it up to a certain level because it's collateral for the loan so it's just letting it go in disrepair is what they're concerned with and that you maintain and protect that collateral just like you would with any traditional loan are there any definitions i guess in what that means by home maintaining or not but tara is the tara? loan servicer on here terry do you have um well there's no exact definition i mean um it's basically as you just went over it's Typical maintenance of your property. So, you know, you keep your lawn mode. It's not, you know, so it meets city code. You keep your home painted if necessary. Um, you know, if, if the deck was falling apart, you would need to fix that, replace it, the roof, so that you don't have leaks in the home, which could ruin the drywall. So it's the normal things that you would have to do to maintain the property. You know, broken windows, fix the windows. So it's just typical things. Anything would fall into that definition. Okay. And Terry, you essentially you have to make sure there's no code violations. Correct. Right. And that's what I was going to say. I usually tell borrowers that if it's going to be hard for us to find out if the house is in disrepair unless you have a code violation or something that would trigger uh, that we would know because because the servicers are not sending people out to inspect your homes randomly. Um, so. Um, and another thing that sometimes um, there will be like if you're in a particular neighborhood there might be neighbors that may report that that the house is falling apart or it's in disrepair and they may even be worried about you as a borrower um, because a safe and sound property is a main requirement 
Uh, another question that came in is, what if a home is destroyed by like a tornado or something like that? Is the loan due and payable at that point, or what happens then? No, the loan is not due and payable. Um, if the borrower, you would use your insurance for that purpose. You would contact the servicing lender, um, notify them that your home was destroyed from the tornado. We would contact your insurance company uh, and work with you to get the home rebuilt. Or if it, if you know the home couldn't be rebuilt, then that insurance would pay off the lender, pay off the debt. But yes, that's how it would work. So you want to maintain your insurance at all times because it's high. It's very important. Okay. Um, and then Peter, there's a question that came in uh, near the end. It said that the 30 days sounds very aggressive for surviving family members to figure out what to do with the house. And this is somebody who's actually been through the process. And, and so she's asking, is there any interest in changing those rules to be more reasonable to ha how people can cope after a, a loss? Well, I don't think it's 30 days to actually figure out. It's 30 days to contact the uh, servicer and let them know that you are working in good faith to handle it. Mm -hmm. That we're uh, plan, you know, we're listing the home with a realtor and putting it on the market, or we're applying for a loan ourselves to be able to pay off the reverse mortgage and buy it. It's just that HUD doesn't want to. Uh, uh, it to go where nobody's doing anything and the home is deteriorating because it's vacant. You know, uh, homes lose value fast when they're vacant. So uh, the concern here is making sure that somebody is maintaining the home and looking after it and working diligently to resolve the situation. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you very much. I want to thank all the experts for their great information and advice. I, I've learned a lot. I think our audience has too. Um, I hope those of you who attended the webinar found it helpful. Uh, if you're interested in any of the materials that you saw, they're in the handout section. You should be able to see here. And the webinar is going to be on reversemortgage.org, uh, so you can get uh, the slides there as well. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.